This Sunday is Pentecost, the feast day when we celebrate the Holy Spirit being given to God's people, and the day we mark as the birthday of the church. On someone's birthday, we celebrate who they are and look ahead to their future. They make wishes and we sing, and there are candles and a cake and gifts. So since this is the church's birthday, I decided to make a cake, chocolate obviously, and I wondered, what does the church wish for, really wish for right now? For sure the church everywhere wishes for it to be safe for people to gather again. And I hope that that wish is more about the health and well-being of the people than it is for the church's well-being. But I wonder. Over the last few weeks and months, I have seen the church as a whole be more concerned with its own narrow issues. Does online communion count? How do we know when it's safe to gather? Can we sing? Can we sing with masks? Than it is with the people who are suffering. This pandemic has exposed in a very obvious way the holes in our safety nets, the fault lines in our culture wars, the problems with our healthcare system, and the fragility of our economy and its vast numbers of wage earners who are doing most of the heavy lift lifting right now, but don't even make a living wage. Events of the last week and the last month and the last years and the last decades have laid bare to those of us with the privilege or bias not to have already seen that racism is still a cancer that kills and incarcerates and dehumanizes and pushes out and underestimates and overlooks and pins to the ground our brothers and sisters of color. And the church as a whole, the church as a body, has not cast out this demon. Why has the church not risen up as a body, as the living body of Christ, and called this evil what it is, and cast it out of our civic body in the name of love? Why has the church sat by, focused on its own narrow concerns, its own self-survival, and let its own soul and the lives of so many slip away. In my 50 plus years, I have not seen the church wish and work together for something truly great, for something worthy of the mighty, roaring gift of the Holy Spirit that set the disciples and those who came in contact with them on fire with love. I, too, have dreamed small dreams of balanced budgets and full pews. I, too, have let the church off too easy, have let myself off too easy not wanting to cause trouble. And in doing so, I have squandered the risky, powerful gift of the Holy Spirit that calls us all, that calls us all to racial and environmental and economic justice. And so this birthday, I'm giving the church the gift of lament the gift of truth-telling, the gift of repentance. It's the litany of penance. It's something we do on Ash Wednesday, and what follows is my best approximation for you of how it looks in my head when I say it. I invite you to join me in it. It begins on page 267 of the Book of Common Prayer. And here's the thing. Once we name the evil that has us in its grip, we can repent, we can change, and we can move on. We can seek healing and wholeness and reconciliation and forgiveness. 
we can receive the gift of the Holy Spirit and work to be a force of love in the world. And then after, if you're still with me, and I hope you will be, you can watch the video that I've put below. It's an amazing sermon by the Reverend Otis Moss III. It's a requiem for Ahmad Arbery. And it is deeply powerful and moving. And I encourage you to watch it. And pay attention to how it makes you feel. Notice the ways in which it makes you feel defensive or angry. And sit with those feelings. Because those feelings may reveal to you the places in you that need healing and that need the gift of the Holy Spirit right now. So join me in the litany of penance. Most holy and merciful Father, we confess to you and to one another and to the whole communion of saints in heaven and on earth that we have sinned by our own fault in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart and mind and strength. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We have not forgiven others as we have been forgiven. Have mercy on us, Lord. We have been deaf to your call to serve as Christ served us. We have not been true to the mind of Christ. We have grieved your Holy Spirit. Have mercy on us, Lord. We confess to you, Lord, all our past unfaithfulness, the pride, hypocrisy, and impatience of our lives. We confess to you, Lord our self-indulgent appetites and ways, and our exploitation of other people. We confess to you, Lord, our anger at our own frustration and our envy of those more fortunate than ourselves. We confess to you, Lord, our intemperate love of worldly goods and comforts and our dishonesty in daily life and work. We confess to you, Lord, our negligence in prayer and worship and our failure to commend the faith that is in us. We confess to you, Lord. Accept our repentance, Lord, for the wrongs we have done, for our blindness to human need and suffering and our indifference to injustice and cruelty. Accept our repentance, Lord for all false judgments, for uncharitable thoughts toward our neighbors, and for our prejudice and contempt toward those who differ from us. Accept our repentance, Lord. For our waste and pollution of your creation and our lack of concern for those who come after us, accept our repentance, Lord. Restore us, good Lord, and let your anger depart from us. Favorably hear us, for your mercy is great. Accomplish in us the work of your salvation, that we may show forth your glory in the world. By the cross and passion of your Son, our Lord, bring us with all your saints to the joy of his resurrection.
Also, I thought you might want to see what it looks like back there. I know it's empty, but it's still our beloved place. And look at the lights. This is all still waiting for us. We'll be back together soon.